Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Happy Black History Month. Um, uh, this is our first annual Black History Month event that NIPSIA is hosting. My name is Victoria Hankson, and I'm a first year master's student in international affairs at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs here at Carleton University. I am a co-representative of the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee at NIPSIA, alongside Veronique Cosette Sharkey and Carla Cisneros. It is truly an honor to have all of you here today to highlight the experiences of Black professionals in Canada. Today, we are going to be discussing how our speakers have overcome systemic barriers and challenges during, during their professional, personal, and academic careers. We hope that this event raises awareness on the experiences and discrimination that Black communities experience daily in all settings, while also highlighting and celebrating the success of our panelists. After the end of the panel, we will have a short Q&A period. Um, we hope that this panel is, again, an annual one. And I also would like to thank our panelists and Professor Adrian Harewood for being here as a moderator. I will pass the mic over to Carla Cisneros for our land acknowledgement. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Carla Cisneros, and I'm a PhD candidate at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs. Um, before we begin our panel for Black History Month, um, we would like to make this land acknowledgement as an intentional and thoughtful way to position ourselves and to provide meaningful and thankful acknowledgement to the indigenous communities whose land we occupy. We acknowledge that we live, gather, and organize on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe Nation. The Algonquin peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to be present in this territory. And before we continue, um, I would like to share a quote from Rosemary Brown, who was the first black Canadian uh, woman to become a member of a provincial legislature and the first black woman in Canada to run for leadership of a federal political party. She said, we must open doors and we must see to it they remain open so that others may pass through. Thank you very much to everyone in this panel for being here and for taking time today to share with us part of your life experiences and your wisdom your leaders and important change makers in our communities, in our workplaces, in the public service, in politics, and many other spaces, and you're opening doors and holding them open for others. And by doing so, you have empowered and inspired many people over the many years that you have done and work on anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. It is truly an honor for all of us to learn from you today. Now, I would like to introduce Dr. Yagadisin Sami, Director of the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University, to introduce our distinguished panel. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Carla. Thanks for pronouncing my first name. It's always a challenge. Bienvenue à tout le monde. Bonjour. Bon matin. Très heureux de vous voir ici. Il commence à faire beau. Ça veut dire que l'hiver est presque arrivé à la fin. I'm delighted to see so many of you this morning. Um, we're joined by a panel of distinguished and accomplished individuals uh, whose bios are pretty long, so I'm not going to read all of them, uh, but I will try to extract what I could uh, from each so that you get a sense of who's going to be speaking to you. Um, I'm not going to do this in the order that people are seated because I'm just going to get confused, so I'm just going to go with whatever name is first on my list uh, that was given to me. Uh, we have Ariel Kayabaga, uh, who's a Canadian politician. Uh, you can see uh, she's on the other side uh, of, uh, of the stage. Uh, she was elected to the Canadian House of Commons in, in the 2021 Canadian federal election, uh, represents the electoral district of London West as a member of the Liberal Party of Canada. Anyone from London West in the, yeah, in the room? Yes, a couple of people actually. Well, they're not you? from there, but they were there. When okay. Was <laughs> Great. Um, uh, Ms. Kayabaga was born in Bujumbura, Burundi, um, so she moved to Canada when she was 11. Uh, she's a graduate of Carleton University uh, in, in political science, um, and uh, before her election she worked as a settlement worker for newcomers to London and also Sonia Ontario. Uh, we have Diana Kinema, who's an accessibility policy 
analyst at Public Services and Procurement Canada's Accessible Procurement Resource Center. Uh, she holds a diploma in procurement, logistics and supply, supply chain management, and an MA in public ethics and policy from St. Paul University. Uh, next to me is Richard Sharp, who's been a human rights advocate for 30 years, both at community and institutional levels. Uh, Richard is currently the director of the Black Equity Branch, Treasury Board Secretariat in the Ontario Public Service. Uh, we have Faduno Ali, who's a planning advisor for the Diversity and Inclusion Directorate of Inclusion. Uh, she's a change agent with over 14 years of experience working for the Department of National Defense, where many of our students end up working afterwards, so I'm sure you'll want to speak with her uh, at some point. Uh, she has led, collaborated on, and co-created a number of anti-racism, equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives, both within DND and across the Government of Canada. Samantha Munsami, Section Head Lead Advisor for Diversity and Inclusion, Material Group, National Defense. If I didn't know any better, I would have thought you were from Mauritius because of your name, but you're from the Caribbean, so I can see where, <laughs> where this uh, name comes from. It's a very familiar name to me. Yes. Uh, she has spent over 15 years in the public service, working in numerous communications, outreach, and engagement initiatives that focuses on the people side of business. I should mention I'm from Mauritius, which is why I look at names very carefully. Uh, so she, uh, she has a, a master's degree in communications and culture and spent some time in Toronto and Barbados during her master's degree. Uh, she has worked and studied in India, China, France, and the Caribbean. And then we have Olivier Jarda. I hope this is how you pronounce your name, is a lawyer and public policy advisor who recently finished a contract as chief of staff and legal counsel with a startup advisory firm, Climate and Nature Solutions. He's the former director of policy and legal affairs to Canada's Minister of Infrastructure and Communities and a former policy advisor to the Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada. Uh, Olivier holds an MPhil in international relations from the University of Oxford, where he studied as a Rhodes Scholar. Last but certainly not least is our own Carleton University's Adrian Harewood, who will be familiar to many of you uh, Professor Harewood joined Carleton School of Journalism and Communication in 2021. Uh, he completed a BA in Political Theory and History at McGill and, a, and an MA in History at Carleton University. Adrian has been a journalist for over 25 years and he's, during that time, he's interviewed many well-known politicians. I had a hard time picking, choosing which ones and I landed on Bill Clinton, Bob Woodward, Naomi Klein and Donald Trump among all the other people that, that he has interviewed. Uh, as a journalist. Professor Harewood's academic interests include the history of black Canadian journalism, the history of the black American press, US civil rights movement, community radio, sports journalism, among others. Professor Harewood created the Carlton Journalism School's first ever course focused on race, a graduate seminar called Journalism, Race and Diversity. He also created the first course in Canada devoted to the study of the history of black Canadian journalism. So without further ado, I'm going to, going to invite Professor Harewood to join us on the stage and he will moderate the discussion. Uh, I look forward to what you have to say this morning. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much uh, for that very kind introduction and good morning. Good morning. How are you? Are you okay? All right. It's good, it's good to see you. Um, you know you're getting old when a person introduces a name from history and you realize you've met the person, <laughs> right? So Rosemary Brown was a trailblazer in this country, and she's someone whose history really needs to be studied very, very closely. Uh, because at a time where there were all kinds of barriers facing people like her, she broke doors open and she made space for people. Uh, and Rosemary Brown, of course, was uh, an MLA in BC and she came very, very close to becoming the, the head of the NDP in the mid-1970s. Uh, and she was really an icon uh, for many of us who, who emerged in the 70s and 1980s. And I had a chance to meet Rosemary Brown, of, in of all places, in a, in a line at the train station. Uh, I was just behind her, and she was such a delightful person. Uh, there was a warmth about her. And she really, she looked you in the eye, and she engaged with you. And she made you feel special. Um, so even though I had a chance to only meet her for, for, for a very short period of time, 
uh, that, that experience has, has stayed with me. Uh, I'm certainly looking forward to the conversation uh, this morning. We have a, a, a panel of quality here. Uh, and so what I thought I would do is I thought I would, would begin by asking the question, I guess the first question to get things started, uh, about Black History Month. Uh, because of course we know that Black History Month was something that emerged out of the United States. Carter G. Woodson, uh, who himself was the son of slaves, comes up with this idea of a Negro History Week in the 1920s as a means of shining a light on the, uh, the accomplishments of black people. Uh, and also providing a kind of a counter narrative to the stories that have been told, the, the, the kind of negative stories that have been told about black people uh, for a very, very long time. Uh, so I'm curious as to what Black History Month means to, to all of you. And perhaps Ariel, we'll start with you. What, what does Black History Month mean to you? Thank you so much um, for having me here and for having this really amazing panel, really, really great people in our community. Um, and um, I, I think Black History Month for me, um, I want to give a little context because I was born in Burundi, Bujumbura, as he mentioned. Uh, the first time I ever celebrated Black History Month was through school because they said we're going to celebrate Black History Month. And they invited a guy to come to our school to speak to us about not getting involved in gangs and uh, really weird conversation. And I just thought, what is this? Right. And we asked ourselves, like, what is Black History Month? And we would walk down the halls of our schools and see pictures of enslaved people who were either no longer enslaved or had passed on. And I thought, this can't be the celebration of Black History Month. We have to change this narrative. And I walked up to the school director and said, I think we have to have a different conversation around Black History Month, because if this continues, many of us will no longer attend this huge assembly where you meet with us to tell us about you know, not getting involved in gangs and, you know, being good, being good citizens <laughs> in our country. Um, and I think we started to own that narrative to first do the education part. I think that a lot of people don't understand what Black History Month represents within the Black community. It's not just a celebration of Black excellence or the, the achievements of Black people, because Black people have been achieving way before we started celebrating Black History Month. I think for me, Black History Month is a time to revisit the interruption of Black history that happened in the past and re-educate and retell the stories of the continued stories of Black people across the world, not just in Canada or in America, but continued um, contributions of Black people. But I want us to continue to talk about the awareness, because I think Many people who today choose to participate in Black History Month celebrations don't really understand what they're doing. And um, I mean, in Canada, we are at 25 years, I think, of Black or 27 of uh, Black History Month celebration. And we're still needing to tell people what not to do. What, what is the proper way to celebrate Black History Month versus what is not the proper way to celebrate Black History Month? So to me, it's a time for us to and it's different for every people, for everybody. But for me, it's a time to revisit the history, to to educate on the interruption that happened, and to continue to showcase the contributions of black black people across um, North America, basically. Okay. And and that history is really different for me because I come from Burundi, and having to learn all of this and and knowing our own history of colonization, and putting all those two things in context and realizing the the amount of effort that was put into interrupting our, our history. And it's really important for me that we do this education uh, and the awareness. And this is why uh, I continue to participate in Black History Month events regardless. Uh, you know, I'm sure many of people on this panel can say we get like a million requests for Black History Month. And all the other months, radio silence, right? But Black History Month comes along, everybody wants you to go speak to their panels. And I want people to ask themselves those questions. Why are you reaching out so much for Black History Month only when we exist all year long? Mm -hmm. Olivia, does that notion resonate with you? Uh, Ariel was saying that, that for her, Black History Month is an interruption. Do you regard it as an interruption? Well, I mean, if I understand correctly, um, Ariel was really focusing on this idea that we have had an interrupted history. Um, interesting term. Um, my take on that is that um, if you look at 
who controls the narrative. I mean, if you're talking about journalism, for example, there's a lot of power behind who gets to tell their story. And Canada's black history uh, is as long as Canada's history. Can Canada has had black people living here since its inception. And um, I think that that interruption in a way um, is, is a fiction. Right? Black, black history has always been here. It is part and parcel of, of Canada's history. Uh, and I think that Black History Month is a way for us to grapple with that, to understand how that came to be, and to, to change that, um, that state um, of relations. Maybe I'll amend the term and say an intervention. intervention. That, yeah. I like intervention um, because I think Black History Month is every year such an important opportunity to intervene in what I see as a status quo that is not changing quickly enough. Um, I've seen uh, on social media in the last few days uh, calls for changing um, history curricula in order to properly integrate Black history. I think that that should always be at the forefront of Black History Month because we don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past. Um, as someone who grew up uh, in Canada in the 80s and 90s, Black history was just non-existent for the most part in our history books. And so I had to do a lot of that work myself or I had to find others in my network in order to, um, to, to have that knowledge feed me, to be rooted in that history and to, to find power in that history. So I think we, we, we owe it to the, the next generations to intervene in that way. Samantha, you know, Black History, well, it was Negro History Week at the time in 1926, but it's been around now for almost 100 years. Do we still need it? I think we absolutely still need it. So, Adrian, for me, Black History Month, it's really a personal, it's personal, it's emotional, it's also rooted in policy. I have many layers, like many of us here. So there's my son there. He's 10 months young, so probably the youngest person in the room. You know, I, I celebrate Black History. His, you know, his father's Black, Jamaican. And for me, you know, from the personal side, I reflect in Black history. How can we do better? How can we lift each other higher? How can we create more opportunities? Um, yes, in high school and younger days, it started through sharing of culture, right? Black history, we all know, through music and literature. And for me now, as um, a specialist in diversity and inclusion at D&D, &D, it's so much more than that. It's policy. And last year before I left on maternity leave, it was really important for me to set up some key frameworks and policies before I left. And one of them was a mandate letter on how to consciously create a diverse and inclu inclusive workplace. And with that, seven action steps to really like get the work done. And for me, that's really important. It's on the GC Wiki, it's, it's open source. Cause I'm like, you know, this stuff should, this is not proprietary. Like we all have a place to do it. So whether it's your first day on the job or you're about to retire, like I think we all have a role in continuing to advance our communities. And once again, that concept of like, how are we lifting each other higher? So for me, that's what Black History Month means. Fadun, I'm gonna ask you the same question. Do we still need Black History Month? Absolutely. Um, Black History Month, for me, as an immigrant, um, has a different meaning. And, and I think I can relate to my African sister here a little bit. It's um, I just to give a little bit of a background as well. We I came here as a refugee, actually, with my mother and four siblings. And, you know, at first, it was um, more of a survival base, right? Adapting to a new country, Black History Month or um, the struggles of Black Canadians was not on our radar. So, you know, we wanted to survive, we wanted to adapt. And so I'm late in the game. And it's extremely important to me because it's, it's a reassurance, it's a guidance for me to learn, to invest the time, to get educated, you know, immigrants in this country, um, although we have our own histories, you know, we're, we're connected to the African diaspora, but the, the, the true story, the black history story here within this country, within North America, um, was new to me. And so I cherish it and I continue to learn, I continue to grow. Um, and I want to, you know, uh, be able to reflect, um, and, and, you know, the society we're living in today, if you don't know 
your history, if you don't know where you came from, it's hard to know where you're going. So it's uh, special to me. Diana, if in fact Black History Month is useful and is of value, as, as some of the and your fellow panelists have, have suggested, what kind of Black History Month do we need? And what is it for? What can it do for us? Thank you for that question. Well, just as it's been said already, Black History Month is a moment where we recognize the many achievements of uh, our predecessors and what we look forward to in terms of um, the development of uh, Black Canadians. Now, for me, Black History Month will mean that showcasing upcoming leaders, supporting them with the right resources, and helping them to pivot um, in their career and educating our upcoming youth and children. I have two beautiful kids who were, well, one was born here and the other one was born in Ghana. Um, being in a new environment and bringing them up, it is important to instill that history that has been created before us. So um, I think that it is very important that we celebrate these moments to educate the uh, upcoming children so that they can also integrate into the system properly and support um, the future. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. So, so Richard, I'm, I don't mean to um, expose you <laughs> in any way, but as, a, as an older head here on the panel, you've seen more black histories, right, than, than some of your, your, your fellow panelists. Um, you know, I was having a conversation with my dad and my dad is 86 years young. And my dad has seen a lot of Black History Months. And he sometimes gets tired, right? He sometimes gets a bit frustrated because he feels as if we've been over this territory over and over again, and we need something new. We need something different. So what, to you, should Black History Month be? Uh, oh, that's a, I, I think that's an excellent question. And, and yeah, I think it's interesting you're equating me with your dad. <laughs> I'm uh, not 80 years old. But, we're of the uh, same generation. We are the same generation, so and we and we're not that old. But um, uh, yeah, I think that's an excellent question, uh, and I wish we had two hours to have this conversation because I think that Black History Month is is a is a beginning of of a 365 days of the year conversation about, as some of my esteemed call, uh, panelists have said, uh, Canadian history. Um, we're foundational to this country. We help build this country for free, right? Um, we have the lashes on our, our backs to, to prove it, generational, generational debt uh, to this country. So, so, so I think it's the beginnings of a conversation really about um, how we chart future and how we situate ourselves within a society that others us, that uh, tries to keep us in a particular place. My, concern, my concerns with Black History Month has always been that um, you know, uh, it is. It is. It contains us in the, and and the issues of black people are contained within, the the coldest and shortest month of the year every year. When when we actually this this is a year long project, uh, decades generations long project, uh, to better situate ourselves, in this in the society. So you know when I talk about um, the history of people uh, from the African diaspora. Uh, to some extent, that includes uh, our sisters around the table uh, from the African continent, because then, then they become part of that conversation, right? And what does that mean for Canada? Like, we don't have those conversations about um, when we do Black History Month, we, we do like parties and galas and, and these kinds of panel presentations to talk about particular issues. But we don't talk about how we root this. We don't talk about how we root Black inclusion within the fabric of Canada in a way that is meaningful for ourselves, our children, and future generations. So, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's, it's nice. I, I, I get a lot of speaking opportunities, and I've had to turn some down, quite frankly, and I do get tired of the song and dance stuff uh, and awards and stuff. But um, I think that it, it's, uh, if we can do this in March and April and, and uh, uh, in January, on August 1st, when where it was supposed to be on Emancipation Day, when the rest of the planet celebrates the uh, uh, the breaking of shackles of, of blacks across the, the planet, then uh, I'd be more akin to sort of start off the campaign of educating people, the campaign of uh, sort of enjoying the, the fruits of the knowledge of your your father and and, and others uh, that help make make this country 
what it is. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's an absence of a contextualizing of what uh, the black experience means in, in Canada. Uh, and uh, Black History Month, I think, gives people an opportunity to, okay, we did the black thing. Now we can go about our business. And, and so I, um, I do have these concerns about that, but um, I think it's the beginning. It's the beginning of a, of a year long work that we should be doing amongst ourselves, regardless of whether or not you are from the African diaspora, because all people need to know this history and it links to the indigenous histories of this land. It links to other people that came after us. At one point, we were the largest immigrant population outside of the European colonizers and settlers. So people don't know that. We don't know how we, uh, how we were part of building this nation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm curious as to all, how all of you got to here uh, because we didn't arrive by spontaneous generation, right? Like all of us have history. We are here because at some point, someone loved us, right? Someone might be sacrificed for us, right? We're, we're standing on the shoulders of people who perhaps weren't able to realize their aspirations, but because of their efforts, we're here. So I want you to think about perhaps one person from your past uh, it could be an actual person. It could be someone that maybe inspired you. But who's that one person, maybe that one ancestor, that one relative whom you want to invoke? And maybe you can tell us a bit about their story and what they taught you. Um, so Olivia, let me start with you. Sure. Um, someone that comes to mind. Well, both of my grandmothers come to mind. What were their names? Um, Alice and Roland. And, and last names? Uh, so Roland, François. Mm. And Alice Latorti. Mm. Where were they from? Haiti. Mm. Well, both of them were from Haiti. Um, Alice uh, was from the north, from Cape Haitian. Uh, and uh, Roland, who we call Zamat, uh, was from the south in Les mm -hmm. Came from very different backgrounds. Um, Alice was a businesswoman. Very, very pro progressive woman. Uh, owned her own uh, general store uh, in Haiti in uh, Cape Haitian. And uh, all of her sisters actually were entrepreneurs. And uh, she had kids very late. She had kids in her early 40s. She ended up having four kids. But she was living a very modern life and you know, doing things her way. She didn't want to get married at 20. She carved out her own career and eventually moved to Canada because of political uh, instability uh, in Haiti. Um, and here, um, worked many, many jobs to support the family uh, and um, was a... Um, Préposée aux bénéficiaires. I don't know what the term is in English, but she worked uh, in the healthcare system in Quebec. Um, worked very, very, very hard. Uh, what did she teach you? What did they teach you? What are the lessons they taught you? I think that the biggest lesson I learned from my grandmothers was one of sacrifice, because I see the amount of sacrifice that they had to make. Uh, in order for me to have the charmed life that I've led. Um, and this is something I think that um, I will always be indebted to, to them for. And I also see the discrimination that they faced in 1970s Canada. You know, I've heard many stories. Things have in some ways stayed the same, but things have also changed. Um, and the, the upward mobility, I mean, we're going to be getting into these issues here but the upward mobility issues that we face today are not the upward mobility issues that that, that generation faced. And there's still many, many barriers, but um, I think that that was the ultimate sacrifice, is to come to a new land where you don't have networks, uh, the culture is very different, and it seems like the state apparatus is built in order to keep you in that lower position so that they can extract quite a lot of value from you, um, but for a different purpose. Mm -hmm. Right, and that purpose is not for your own uh, self-actualization. Samantha, I'd like to honor my father. So I'm here as a result of a letter that my dad wrote. Um, I was just born in Guyana, South America, and there was no power. And he says he lit an oil lamp and wrote to his family in Canada. So his sisters had immigrated already. So they went from London to to Canada. This is through the British um, colonization system. So my dad writes the letter and asks, you know, can you please sponsor me? Like I have this dot. Like so, his why, his intrinsic why, became so strong now that I was born. So I think growing up hearing that story. 
Um, so as much as I don't remember living in Guyana, it, it was in my DNA. I felt it that I that there was, you know, I'm here and, you know, how I'm how am I going to, you know, um, really, re I don't want to say repay, but I always felt this sense of like, I wanted to do good. I wanted to be of service and I really wanted to help others. So someone helped us get here and, you know, back to your quote from Rosemary Brown of opening those doors. Like I'm now the section head for diversity and inclusion at D&D and Material Group. Material Group is full of engineers. My dad is an engineer. Like he'd be so happy to see me in this role now. Um, you know, the limitations of him not knowing in uh, French stopped him from ever having a career in the public service. Um, so he wasn't represented in the public service, but I know he always loved, like he was so happy for me in, in my, in my early twenties when I got my first government job. So, you know, I, I had the privilege of learning French, working really hard and being in this position now. So, um, you know, that, that flame of him is definitely inside of me. And I know he sacrificed so much, uh, for us to get here. And, uh, he didn't get to see this in real life, but I know that he's, he's watching down and very happy. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Wow, Samantha. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I think it's my mother. So, I mean, often we relate to our parents. Um, my mother was came from a small village um, in Ethiopia, Duridawa. And it, it, like back home, we don't have anti-Black racism issues. We have tribalism. We have um, class systems like that, that discriminate. Um, and so the life she had, you know, endured um, from a young age, being married at a very young age, fleeing, you know, the genocide in Ethiopia from Somali people were being um, killed, f you know, just going from one country to another to another and the struggles she's been through to brought us here today um, in Canada, the sacrifices she made, um, that's what keeps me going, I think. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, we, I can't disappoint, you know, it, it took a lot to get us here. So that's what I reflect on. And that's what encourages me, her, her faith, her strength to keep going and going. And so, yeah. Diana. Thank you. Um, one person that has inspired me to do what I do uh, in this space is um, Mary Odum, who is from Ghana. She came to Canada about um, 30 years ago and had um, a degree in nursing, but it will take her years to realize that she wasn't being employed. She wasn't given an opportunity in the nursing field, and she was being told to go back to school because her qualifications does not match the experience that we need in Canada. So this woman will take the opportunity to establish an institution on her own and then employ immigrants to come and work with her. Now, her journey inspires me because it gives me hope that we can actually build um, an empire for ourselves if we don't have the opportunities and we are not our potentials are not recognized. Um, aside that, um, I also inspire myself because my journey is quite different from everyone else. And I think that um, giving myself the opportunity to showcase what I can do um, will inspire other people as well. So okay. that is it for me. Okay, thank you. Richard. Um, I, I'm going to go along the same kind of uh, path that uh, some of my uh, panelists uh, colleagues have said, and, and I will say that my parents, both my parents, uh, have been the most inspirational uh, people in my life um, for two different reasons, uh, and I'll try to be brief. Um, my parents came here uh, um, via England uh, from Jamaica. Uh, my father was in university educated at Oxford, came here and got his master's at London, Ontario. I was actually born in London area. Because um, my my dad picked London because he was in London, England, and they were looking. <laughs> they even have a Thames River just like here, and so came to London. But it was a it was a it was I would say a horrific experience uh, for my family. Um, uh, horrific. 
horrific in the late 60s. Uh, this is just after the civil rights movements uh, in the states uh, or the culmination of that. Um, uh, Anti-black racism was rife here, um, even though uh, they were received fairly well by sort of the Christian base uh, in London. Um, it was an oppressive place and we, and we ended up escaping. Uh, I always say we escaped London. I know it's better now, Aria. I know it's better now, now that you're there. It's a <laughs> remarkable achievement given the history, and again, the history of London and, uh, and, uh, and all that, um, you know, during the, you know, Uncle Tom's Tavern days and the blacks that were escaping into Canada came through there and all the troubles they had. But well, my parents, uh, you know, my father, I think was, I know, I know he, was, he was destroyed by the white supremacy experience in this country. He was, um, you know, heartbroken by not being able to provide for his family. And my mother with her grade eight education was able to raise six children um, because he was not able to do so. So, you know, I take great strength knowing that before my father came to this country, he was an activist, I found out later in life. He was an anti-racism activist in England and he had to flee England because of some of the things that he was trying to do to address uh, anti-black racism there. And my mother, both of them being really good communicators, great communicators, I think I'd drawn that from them, both as activists of spirit, but my mom's way of dealing with people in a way that doesn't, you know, you know, make sure you don't get killed, right? And, and that you actually get to the next stage and, and, you, and you bring warmth and love to your engagements with people who, who want to kill you or want to harm you or want to prevent you from accessing opportunities and privileges and things that other people should have. So I find that they have been, um, I always reflect on their lives whenever I'm doing anything, even this. Uh, and uh, I think my dad would be smiling. And I know my mom is smiling from some beach in Jamaica right now because that's, that's where we as her children sent her. Because that's where she wants to be when it's cold in February. Mm -hmm. Ariel. Um, so I had a, I had, I had written down Harriet and I had a really good story as to why I was going to put down Harriet because Harriet is sort of the genesis as to why I really wanted to be involved in anti-black racism. Um, when you say Harriet, you mean Harriet Tubman? Yes. Right. Yes, yes. Because I, you know, after being taught about, you know, enslaved people and never how they escaped and their, their, their stories of strength and power and how they fought back, I did a little digging to know her story a little more and she turned out to be quite the most amazing woman in history. Not She didn't just help 750 slaves flee, she fought back. She fought back and she was part of a strategy that helped even more people escape. So that's why I had written her down. But, um, and just as Richard just said, London, um, London is a work in progress. Uh, we're still a work in progress, I think saying that London is completely better would be a uh, misjudgment of what uh, racism is like in, in, in this country. And it, it's quite fascinating because London has had the most traffic of black people in this country. Uh, most people who came to this country came through London. Mm -hmm. It has a rich history of black presence in the Canadian history. Um, and an important newspaper, The Dawn of Tomorrow, that came out of London. The Dawn of Tomorrow came yeah. out of London. There was the first um, baseball league that came out of yep. London. And yet, in 2018, London elected its first black women on council. In 20, 2005, London elected its first black men on council. So, like, there's never been leadership. Uh, there's not a lot of leadership of, of black people. And that presence is really, um, you have to dig, you have to go to find these black families to know the history of black people in London. And to this day, that history is completely omitted. Um, but I'll end this by saying that for me, um, my mom opened the door for me. Um, my mom is just like my sister here. Is from, we're from the East African part of the continent and we've had similar histories of uh, enduring and surviving genocides. Um, and she managed to bring her kids here um, and I see her as a, she's not a businesswoman. She's not somebody who's made a huge name for herself, but you know what? She built me 
she gave me the character that I have today to be able to do what I do every single day. And to this day, she continues to be my role model because I'm here in Ottawa um, doing what I do, right? Representing people. And um, she sits at home and watches my kid for me. And she takes him to do all the other things that I can be there and do. So she continues to be uh, that beacon of light who said, we're going to go to Canada, to this country that was not very kind to us when we first arrived. And she endured everything and she taught us to respond with love she told us to keep our heads down to keep working harder if they you know uh require to bring 100 bring 250 percent so that we can continue to create legacy and i have a son he's 13 um amazing kid and i don't say this because i'm his mom but i'm sure if i was not his mom i'd think the same thing he has a different approach about his existence as a black man in this country and the way that he lives that also inspires me and none of that would be i wouldn't be here my son wouldn't be if my mom did not take that huge chance to live in a city like london like richard gave the little history and background of london and today london has added my name in the history in his history books and i hope we continue to to write those stories but none of it would be without my mom and harriet tubman and a lot of other people that i can't mention yeah. so so all of you have laid out your foundation right we have a, we have a better sense of you now but the truth is that you wouldn't be here had you not asserted yourselves right and had you not been able to kind of navigate the various spaces in the way in which you do um, you know tony morrison the, the nobel laureate very famously once said that you know when you have these positions of power Right, like when you're in a position, your job when you're in the workplace is to free other people. Right, that's your job. Your job is to try to free other people. So, Ariel, I'm going to come back to you again. I, I'm just curious as to you know how, what is your modus operandi? How do you go about operating in the workplace? And what are some things that maybe you can pass on? Some lessons that you could, you've learned that you can pass on to some of the folks in this room right now. It's a really good question. Um, I can look around this room and spot like two people that I know I've mentored. Uh, mentorship and opportunity, um, and I don't, we call it mentorship, but it's not really mentorship. I think it's creating space for people to have access to the same power that you've had access to. And I think I talk about this so much because growing up in London, I didn't see myself represented anywhere. And not only did I not see myself represented anywhere, there was a heavy feeling of, not being wanted in in the city of London and in having to have those conversations with different leaders who were across the country the, the 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 city and asking them like how come I don't see black people in your leadership and yet there's so many of us who live in this city and when it was you know when we talked about black people it was often in a very negative light they would report on and i think someone had talked about journalism being really powerful they would report on our bad stories but never our good stories so then the, the imbalance there becomes so strong because we are so th there's a smaller percentage of us and you're only reporting on the bad things there's no way all of us are bad and there's no way all of us are not doing great things and i know that because i have black friends i have black family members who live in this city and I don't hear their stories being told. So in my approach, in the way I do things, I open space. And I think- How do you do that? I invite people who I don't see at the table. Um, I know as a young black woman, uh, especially a single young black woman, I feel that I have to, to do a lot to be taken seriously. The other day, my brother, actually this is really funny, he watched me on CPAC and he said, you look like you made me think of uh, Hillary Clinton. He's like, you're dressing like a 50-year-old woman. Um, and Listen, said, there's nothing wrong with being 50, you know? You know what? I'm not 50. <laughs> no, that, that, that sounds like a kind of but, a diss. Yeah. He, he was like, he was coming for me, and he said, you're looking like your regular politician. When I think of a politician, I, I, I just, that's what you look like now. And I, and I had to reflect on that. I said, you know, I would like to dress like how I dress regularly, but I get stopped at the door, right? Like security will ask me whose office I'm from and to prove that I'm allowed to be in this space because of me dressing the way that I want to dress. So I've had to conform and dress how 
most people dress in this place. I'm not stopped at the door and I'm not asked to leave and I'm not asked to prove. It's embarrassing when you're asked to prove that you belong there. Um, so my job is to invite a lot of young women, um, diverse young women, whether they're black or from other ethnic backgrounds, to give them the opportunity to own up the space. And this is the one thing I always say to them. You're going to walk in there. They may treat you funny, but own it own it. I walked in the room once and I was the one hosting the meeting and they asked me to grab them water. I went and got them every single one of them water. When I sat down to start the meeting, every single one of them was embarrassed. What do you say to that young person who says, you know, Ariel, you've capitulated, like you've given in. I'm right? You're, you're dressing, you're, you're dressing, you're dressing in. like you're just trying to be conventional like the other folks. Peace. I'm choosing my peace. And you know what? Sometimes wearing these high heels looks really nice. <laughs> sometimes wearing these high heels looks really nice. And sometimes putting on that blazer that maybe Hillary Clinton has worn in the past looks, looked nice on me. And it's strategic and, and, and it's strategic. And you know what? I'm going to walk in there. Nobody's going to bother me. So I'm choosing my peace because we're not in a post-racial society. We're not in a society that is respectful of young people or of young women who are in positions of power. So yeah, sometimes I choose my peace and I think I'm okay with that. And I think it does a lot more good than harm sometimes for me to choose my peace. R Richard, how do you navigate spaces? What's your, what's your philosophy in, on how to operate in the workplace? Um, well, I think I do the opposite of uh, Ariel. Um, <laughs> I disrupt the space. Oftentimes, when I walk in the door, uh, I grew my hair long. I just made a decision in 2016 that I wasn't going to, you know, try to contain my blackness in my workspace. Um, I be my authentic self. I, I'm Has there been a cost to that? Because a Ariel cost. suggests that there's a, Ariel a huge, suggests that there's a cost. A huge cost. I because I totally agree with Ariel and and her and her approach because there are multiple different ways of tackling this beast of uh, anti-blackness in our societies and in our structures and institutions. Yeah, I've, I've been stopped going into uh, Parliament Hill of people asking me, even when I've had my pass, asking people, uh, people uh, security, asking me, looking at me, and saying that you're not normally the kind of guy that comes in here. It's like, what do you mean you're meeting with the Prime Minister? And it's like, what are you going to do? I'm gonna I'm gonna help save Canada. <laughs> what do you mean I'm gonna do? You guys are going to the toilet without me. You, you know, are, are my peoples. So, you know, I I think that the um, uh, last thing I'll say on this is that I I often talk, especially around public institutions. I I equate it to the to the Matrix. You know, the, that 1999 film, a brilliant science fiction film, about um, you know um, uh, systems and and people unable to see that they're in a system uh, and that how we are in a system. And so I, I, I feel like I'm, my children are always saying, Dad, you're the one, you're Neo. And I'm like, no, Neo dies at the end of that thing. And I was like, I don't like these, these heroes that die and the martyrdom thing, I'm not down with it. So you learn, again, from history, you learn from the people who came before who have aspirations and visions for a better society and a better way of being. Um, but uh, there are so many sort of parallels with that movie and I think our lives and, and being able to see through the code. Um, I think that how I've navigated this, this society with my long hair and my black male self, the black males are the most feared group in this society, right? We see it everywhere. That's why our, <laughs> The prisons are overrepresented. We're underrepresented in senior leadership roles. There can only be one black male minister in the federal government. There can only be, you know, we don't have it yet in the provincial government. Like, I understand that. But how I've navigated that is that I understand what the fear is. I understand through history what came before me. And so that's helped me to understand, like, how when I'm engaging in those systems with these people, uh, I, understand, I know what's going to happen. I know what my reaction will be to my interventions, as um, as you had stated before, and so I think that's that uh, that's helped somehow to keep me safe because there's um, I used to say at justice when I went to justice as an executive they used to say I used to say you know I have no reason being here and my my executive said like, don't 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 say that my my boss don't say that because people will think that you're not qualified but I said no man. I'm not supposed to be here. <laughs> Look around the table. You've made it very clear that I'm not supposed to be here by the exclusion around these tables. I'm an executive now. I'm the only one in the entire department. You have 300 executives. 
how can I be the only black male in this space? So I think that, you know, to, I said I was going to be short. I'm not short. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, understanding systems, being able to see through the code, being able to communicate and move through the code in a way that where you see your objective, you can still uh, achieve your objective. Uh, it's something that, again, I learned from my, my parents um, and I've learned from people who came before me because this is not uh, this is not for the faint of heart this work my goodness I've seen people destroyed um, but uh, I guess last thing I will say again I'm not last one. I have a lot of fun doing this work I think it's just I think it's absolutely hilarious that I can occupy some of the spaces that I do and that people are forced to listen to me because there are so many people behind me as you say those people that are shoulders that we stand on so uh, yeah, a long-winded way of saying there's a multiplicity of things that are, are playing into um, um, how I've been able to navigate uh, these spaces and, and achieve mm -hmm. despite the obstacles that continually are put mm -hmm. in my way and the way of our people. Faduno, same question. How have you navigated the various workspaces that you've occupied? Um, I, Richard, I'm glad you have, uh, he, he has a sense of humor. I think that's how you get through uh, some of the, the work that we do. I would have to say I, I'm more like Richard. Um, I, I like to challenge everything and, and he's one of my mentors actually. And although I don't speak like him because I want to keep my job, um, <laughs> and he has, you know, he doesn't, uh, doesn't have that fear, but I'm still learning. Um, you have to, like for me, I, I like to challenge the status quo. I like to, you know, uh, knock at every door, regardless of what the answer will be or the face behind, you know, that door. Uh, but I also respect um, Ariel's opinion as well or, or perspective because everyone is at a different level, right? Um, so what's a specific thing that you've done in the workplace? Can you kind of give us an example? Of, of a way in which you've asserted your power? I'm, I'm the, um, civil, the national civilian co-chair for the, the defense team Black Employee Network. And I think we've achieved several um, ways in creating um, a safe space and a sense of belonging for our community, the defense team Black employees. Um, and you know, some of the things we've done um, just um, one of the, the milestones that I, I truly celebrate is commemorating Black History Month. So we demanded our presence, being true to ourselves. Um, believe it or not, um, you know, Black History Month is not, wasn't nationally recognized within my department. And so we kept pushing. The, the resistance was real. Uh, we kept pushing, pushing, because that acknowledgement gave us uh, that safe space, broadened that safe space to a nat national um, place, right? So, uh, you know, allowing, uh, for me, the way I navigate this is respecting everyone's uh, perspective and where they are on that spectrum. Everyone learns differently when it comes to the um, anti-racism world, but also, you know, amplifying uh, people's voices. Um, creating opportunities, like some of my panelists here had said, um, you know, um, sponsorship, and, and I, I use this as well, mentorship is great, but we need sponsors, people who will advocate for you when you're not in the room, right, who, who will vouch for you, who believe in your achievements and, and what you're able to accomplish. Um, and because I have these, you know, I've created this, this network for myself. I like to um, create that opportunity for others as well. Olivier, you, you've occupied some rather rarefied spaces. You, you've been in some, you know, lack of a better term, elite spaces. You're, you're a Rhodes Scholar. So, of course, you attended Oxford University. So you've been in a lot of rooms that many people here perhaps might not have been in. Again, I'm curious as to how you've been, how you have chosen to navigate these various spaces that you've occupied. Yeah, um, hasn't always been easy. Um, I would say that one way that I navigate is I try to be flexible. What does that mean? Um, I think I've, in in a way, developed a bit of a chameleon aspect to 
to being in a space. And I think that's really like a survival tactic. For example, if I need to be professorial, I can be professorial. If I need to be more of a person of the people, I can be a person of the people. So you're a code switcher par excellence. I think, yes. Code switching has been, I mean, yeah. Like imagine me with a big Afro in Oxford, England in an IR seminar, uh, you know, trying to assert myself, right? Um, and these are places where, you know, sometimes people who look like me, you know, generally are not made to feel welcome, even if they are qualified. So it's it's not just enough to to be able to be there and to play the part, but I think it's also um, navigating with the understanding that um, people are going to make it difficult for you, sometimes unconsciously. And 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 I, I've told myself try not to take it personally, and it's it's very very difficult to do. But that is something that's helped me navigate these spaces, understanding that there are systemic forces at play. Perhaps there's an individual in front of me who's telling me something that is completely inappropriate or is acting in a way as to make me feel uh, very excluded. Um, but it's not a they versus them situation in my mind. There are bigger structures at play. And the reason I'm there is to change those structures. So I always have that in the back of my mind. People look at your CV and say, this guy's really successful. He's never had any self-doubt. Is that true? Self-doubt, no, self-doubt is, is always there to a certain extent. So how do you deal with the self-doubt? Um, I think I need you feed off of it. In a way, for example, um, if you're going into a meeting, um, make sure that you are like the most prepared person at the meeting. Mm -hmm. We've heard, you know, this idea that if you're black or if you're a person of color, you know, you have to jump higher, run faster, you have to do more work. I don't fully follow that. I think you have to be strategic. You have to really know how to use your energy, right? Is this the meeting where you have to be the most prepared person in the room? If it is, make sure that you are. And so that self-doubt I used in order to learn more about myself, more about my weaknesses. Um, and, 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 you, know, you, know, you know, you just made me think of this interview that I did years ago with um, this remarkable man named Raymond Moriyama. Uh, Raymond Moriyama is in his 80s. He's actually in his 90s now. And he's the architect who designed the War Museum in Canada. Uh, and Raymond Moriyama's family was interned in the 1940s for Japanese Canadian. He was interned, like David Suzuki's family too. Um, and Raymond Moriyama's father always told him that his job was to be excellent. That's all. Right? His job was to, to kind of drive a nail of gold into everything that he did. Um, so yeah, that that what you just what you just said kind of sparked that that in me. Um, Diana, in terms of your navigation of these spaces, how do you do it? Well, just like Fadrina, I, um, I use my voice to advocate for the voiceless. So um, back in 2020, when George Floyd died and all departmental organizations within the federal public service were advocating for inclusion, following the CLEC's mandate to be more inclusive, um, what I did was to co-found the Black Employee Network at RCC, Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada. And I took that opportunity because I realized that there weren't a lot of Black employees in the executive level. Even in management, it's very limited. And um, I remember reaching out to Richard because I was... Uh, a little nervous. I'm like, Richard, do you think taking up this uh, opportunity will stunt my career? Is it going to affect me in negatively? Richard said, you know what? Do it. Just do it. I, I, took, I took his advice and I co-established a network. And within a year, we were able to bring 150 employees together. Um, I was able to support my team in getting approval from the deputy minister at the time, um, the assistant deputy minister at the time, uh, Caroline Xavier, mm. who was able to support us, appointed a director to be a champion for the network. And we were able to use the platform to voice out some of the concerns of black employees, lack of career progression, microaggressions, um, you know, so much, it makes me emotional to talk about it because 
<laughs> I had I had the opportunity to portray some of the real um some of the happenings of and the experiences of black employees that were not spoken of. The focus group sessions that we held revealed experiences that were very touching. So I think I use my little platform to be the voice of the voiceless. I've also had the opportunity to, um, when I at attend meetings, so what I do is when I attend meetings um, on Zoom or on Teams and we haven't been big gatherings, I look in the room and when I see that it is not representative, I take the opportunity to voice it out. Either by raising my hands and asking why we have all these panels without black people, without people with disabilities. So I try to use my voice to ask questions that are very difficult to ask. Mm -hmm. Can I kind of just add one, like ask one thing? Because it seems as if to you, in the workplace, you've been intentional in building community. And can, can you kind of talk about the importance of networks and relationships and building community within the workplace? Um, yeah. One thing I would like to say, though, that leadership comes in different forms. Now, when we talk of leadership, mostly it is perceived as holding a directorship role, being a deputy, or being in a very high role to be able to um, exert power. But I see it as um, you can be a leader in at any level, advocate at any level, and use power at any level. And it has to be strategic um, by being able to command resources. So it is not just you being in that role, but being able to command resources, being able to advocate on behalf of people, making a difference is what, um, how leadership should be. So yeah. Can I, um, can I add to that? Sure. The, being a part of networks is crucial for me. Like, knowing, when you, especially when you, if you enter uh, the workforce or you know, being a student or whatever it is, um, being a part of, of a network is going to be vital because, um, like you said, it gives you that sense of community. It's a safe space. But I recently, we just had a, uh, a network event um, uh, on Friday. And, you know, some of the, the individuals that came out, it's hard to bring people out. It's hard to, to um, get individuals to commit or to join these networks. And one of the individuals said um, that she was just tired. She doesn't want to fight. <laughs> and, and a lot of people think that we're there. It is, you know, for myself personally, it, it, it is a fight. You know, I want to fight the, the systemic barriers and so on. But it doesn't have to be for everyone. It could be a safe space. It could be a place where, you know, you share your shared lived experiences. You, I mean, you, you share your lived experiences. Um, and and you, you, it's a place to get, uh, to meet new new people, mentors, you know, people who have been through um, what you are going through, for, perhaps. So it doesn't always have to be, it's great, it gives that leadership um, perspective, but there's also the other side, and what we're trying to create is is that safe sense haven, right? Yeah. In a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. yeah. Samantha, what about you? How have you navigated spaces you've occupied? So I think we can all agree if there wasn't community, we we would die, like, right? So my son, he's 10 months. He couldn't live without us, right? So honestly, community has been the center of my my existence of the work I do. So as I mentioned, I'm the section head for diversity and inclusion in uh, one of the 21 organizations within D&D. &D. So my organization, uh, you know, set up my ADM, set up a role, a full-time position for someone like me to own a space at the executive table. We need to see more of this. And, you know, I get, I have the privilege of working with Faduno and Diana on a regular basis at work. And if it wasn't for the work that we're all collectively doing, 
as Richard said, it's not for the faint of heart. Um, this is this is not, you know, I don't switch off the lights at five o'clock and this forgets, right? I've been on maternity leave now for 10 months. I still think about this work every single day. I'm reflecting, I'm dreaming about it. Like it's in my, it's in my DNA. And it's because I care so much about community. I care so much about opening doors. I'm a mix of, like, I love the word strategic. So my strategy is I it's true I am a code switcher I am a, a bit of a chameleon because deep down I am the disruptor but I understand there's fear and there's love so when you're in fear what happens like you get closed off right so imagine I come in I'm the new section head for diversity and inclusion I go into the engineers symposium and they introduce me for the first time for a lot of people that could be fear like who's this person why is she coming in what is she going to say so guess what they're closed right at the beginning, right? They're not even going to hear anything I'm going to say. So what do I do? And it took me a while to understand this. So what's my strategy? It's love. So I had to take a moment and step back and be like, how can I bring love to this room first? Because when you bring love, people are calm, people are open, they've got a good vibe, right? Like you're, you're in a creative, innovative space. So what do I do? I talk about layers and I talk about how we all have privilege and we all have disadvantage, no matter who you are. Some people have more privilege than others. And where are you on that spectrum? And reflect back in on you. And when I start the conversation like that, it's not a, a us versus them conversation. Suddenly now we're all in this together. So for me, like that's how I built community. And that's how I start the conversation. And then I go in, like I've, I've, got, the, I've got the stats, I've got the disruptor, I've got the courageous conversations. I've got what I wanna talk about when it comes to representation. I've got what I wanna say about removing barriers for a policy or a program or something that I don't see that's right. But because I started with love, people are open to the conversation. A really quick question before we just ask folks to post questions. Because I, because I hear this sometimes from younger people that they're tired, right? And they feel that some of the obstacles and barriers they face are, um, it's a sign that perhaps this space is not for them. And, and they kind of feel as if it's not worth the effort. It's not worth the struggle. So I'm curious as to what keeps you going. What keeps you motivated? How do you... How do you struggle against that? How do you struggle against being discouraged? Maybe that's the way I wanted to put it. Um, Richard, how do you do it? Um, um, there are a couple of things. Um, I guess for me, um, I have I have children, um, not not as young as as yours anymore. I uh, thank God. <laughs> um, they're big, um, but. Um, I knew that when my son was born, my life was changed forever. Like, oh my gosh, my kid is going to go through what my dad went through, his grandfather, and me, if I don't do something. Like, it's this is a this is a matter of survival for my for my children, like mm -hmm. two beautiful daughters, right, as well as my my son. Um, so that's that's the main my main um, driver. And plus, I've got this really strong sense of um, uh, justice. It's, it's burning in my belly. Uh, my mom would tell me uh, in my late 20s, she told me that I was, um, um, Sam Sharp is a relative, uh, a descendant. Uh, and my father kept that from us. Who because, should, you should tell people who Sam Sharp oh, was. Sam, Sam Sharp was the uh, revolutionary leader in Jamaica that basically brought down enslavement. He, he led, or his, he's purported to have led the largest slave revolt in, in Jamaica. In, in the 1830s. 1830s and the statues, and, and, uh, and it's partly why people in Canada are afraid of Jamaicans, because it caused revolutions. Um, so, you know, my mom felt that that was, my dad felt that if we knew what our history was, that we would subscribe to that and he was afraid for our safety and our security because we needed to try to assimilate as best as we could to be normal considered to be normal um, uh, and I get that 
Um, but because we do have kids and because we do see that they need to have a future here, which I am doubtful. I am doubtful that my children have future in, in this country. We, we're actually making plans to extract them from this country and come here to visit mm -hmm. so that they can be in places where they're not always under the white gaze. And even though we help build this place, similar to the way my parents helped build England and then left, maybe we have to do that here too. But that's a different, that's a different discussion right now. It's really actually really interesting. I was saying before the session that my son is leading, uh, is doing, uh, first time he's doing a, um, an interview, uh, some panel here that I'm going to skip work, just go see uh, with Ralston, Ralston King. He's interviewing Ralston. Um, the city councilor. The city councilor, Ralston King. Um, so even though he's totally against his activism stuff, I'm a soccer player, Dad. I'm a soccer player. I'm not an activist. Mm -hmm. He's in the space, right? So I think what we can do is like when, as, our, as your, your children get a little bit older, you know, inculcate them with this desire to push, to assert their rights and their place in this society, which means that there needs to be a little bit of an activist agenda that we build into our, our, our children. So I am the example of that. I embody that for my children and, and others. This is how you can do activism. You're not going to always do it like me. Uh, but for me, the little, little time that I have on this planet to do this work, I'm hoping that I uh, support um, movement and thought and uh, sort of activism for, for positive and constructive change in this society. Faduna, Richard just said a very serious thing. <laughs> like, like he kind of said it very casually. And, and, and we, need, we, need, we need probably two more hours to have this conversation properly. If, if I understand correctly, what he said was that he doesn't believe his children have a future in this country. You know, it, do, you, do, do, you, do you feel your children have a future in this country? And if so, how do you go about creating the country that you want them to live in? Richard, you must have a, a great plan B because <laughs> um, it's, it's hard, you know. It often, what's hard? What's hard about it? What's hard is, is um, staying here. Why? Know? Well, I'm, I'm Somali, so Somali people are... Uh, no man's like we we continue to move uh, to find um, a place that is suitable for us that where we can thrive where we can have a sense of community um, doesn't matter you know where it is but there's also that notion of always returning home you know that when you ask me where is home it's not here um, and in terms of like you know raising our children here, I think it's a great place to raise them here. Um, but it's is it forever? I don't know. That that idea is always there um, for us. But is the grass greener on the other side? Like we've seen the struggles um, of back home as well, and the privilege we have of being here. So for me, like from my perspective personally, uh, I'm gonna fight. And, you know, for as long as I can, I'm going to fight to see, hopefully, um, that my children will have a different outcome. You know, it might not be 180, you know, turnaround, but it, it, there's a difference. Um, and I think we're going to continue to make that difference. Um, instead of your, your question in regards to coping and, and how, you know, we, we maintain, how do we, working in this environment, experiencing it, uh, living it through, you know, I have four children, three are teenagers. Uh, my oldest son is, is 15, he's turning 16. And you're and 25, how is that possible? <laughs> huh? Huh? You're 25. It's, huh? it's, it's uh, hmm. you know, it's, it scares me. Every time he steps, goes out the door, you know, he's six foot two and, and huge. He's, all I see is a target. Um, so the fears are still there. I think it's just day by day that that's how I cope, you know, and I have a few people on speed dial where, uh, and Richard is one of them because he hears me crying every day about like this, this work is too much, you know, we need to, you need to, something has to give, but having, um, create that, that sense of community, that network for yourself, have, you know, having that, um, um, those individuals that 
you know, will acknowledge your accomplishments because that's hard too. Not being recognized, all of the stuff we do is not compensated, right? It's not, we do it from the side of our desks. Um, it's, it's my day job, it's, it's my volunteer work, it's my community. Uh, I run a nonprofit for black youth as well. And it's, we're not compensated for it, but you know, some, it's, it's, it gives me a sense of purpose. And it, in an environment that wasn't built for us, I think, I think we've come a long way and, and there's still um, a lot to do, but it's just one day at a time for me. Olivier, do, do black children have a future? In this society, and and if so, how do you go about building that that place where they can belong, where that place that you want them to to live in? I think the answer, the short answer, is yes. They have a future, but that we have such a responsibility to help shape that future, so that the squandered potential that we are seeing in this current generation, in the past generations of our parents, grandparents, etc., um, is not repeated. So we, we have a responsibility to break that cycle, and, and that is a huge motivator for me. Um, I'm of Haitian descent. Um, Haiti had um, an incredibly important part in the world's history uh, in that um, Haitian independence and that rebellion led to the first black republic, which was huge in terms of setting the stage for, um, for independence for many other colonial countries. Um, I feel like the work is not done, and it is my duty to continue that work. Um, I have actually um, um, a kid um, who is just about to arrive, so we're, we're expecting any minute now. So I think that also changes my motivation. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd like to add that being on this panel and seeing all of these vibrant and varied and different identities and different histories is so enriching and motivating to me as well. Uh, and, and to borrow from uh, an IR theorist, uh, Lean Hansen uh, out of Copenhagen, um, our identities are so important in shaping policy. So um, and there she's talking about foreign policy, but you could broaden it to just policy in general. So Ariella talked about who is at the table. I feel like we need to be at the table because every one of us is bringing so much that if we're not there, it's just lost. So what does your presence in particular bring to a policy discussion? How do you change the dynamic? Um, I think that, um, you know, to borrow from critical um, race theory and intersectionality, I think as a black person, as a young black person, also son of immigrants, um, my interest, advancing my interest actually advances the interests of many people, mm -hmm. right? Um, like take someone, for example, who has accessibility issues, uh, to give you a very physical example. Um, if you advance their interest, you're also advancing perhaps the interests of a pregnant woman who may not always have accessibility issues, but who has accessibility issues at, at, at one point in time. So I feel like to the policy discussion, I don't just bring my own experiences, but I try to bring my community's experiences. And I've tried to be very democratic in the way I develop policy. I want broad stakeholders uh, involved as much as possible. And, and I think the consultative process is so important. And oftentimes in politics, things are moving so quickly that it's easy to sort of fast track consultations because you're trying to get to a certain end. But I see those consultations as part and parcel of the process, as an integral part to getting where we need to go. So I try to keep a big tent and it's not, you know, me as a person with ideas, as an elite who can tell you what is best for the country or for the community. I'm a mouthpiece. And so that's, that's what I think I try to bring. Diana, how are you able to influence policy making, policy construction? Um, thank you for that question. Well, I, I come from a space where I work in SSV, actually. So I'll build on what Olivier said. Um, get a stakeholder involvement is very important in making changing these policies now um, I do think that while we are building policies around inclusion diversity and um, um, uh, pivoting the work that we're doing I would like to also say that we have to think about um, ensuring that these policies are practical 
they will be able to support the growth of black youths and uh, our children that are coming up. I have two kids myself, and for me, working in this space and advocating for change, we'll see that their future is set. So yeah. Samantha, how do you influence the policy making space? So it goes back to your first question that Black History Month isn't just a month, it's a conversation all the time. And in my role, that's how I think. Every day I wake up and I say representation matters always, every day, at all different layers. So I reflect on that every day in my space and I'm able to bring that voice um, to the table to, to really do that. And I want to say to everyone in this room, because you also brought up a point of like some people think they're tired and I would just say like there's room for all of us and I always encourage people when we have so I have um, an L1 diversity inclusion working group so there's about 75 members from all across my organization we have these conversations on a bi-weekly basis and I always say there's a round table part to it and I always say use your voice like practice using your voice don't wait till it's like this big thing like George Floyd to like suddenly speak up because like start on like little, little examples every day. Like I think if we all just start, you know, like now I can look at a policy or a program and I can audit it very quickly and see the barriers. And then I can speak up and say like, this is what's going on, right? But I didn't happen to just leapfrog into that, right? Like there, I took baby steps to get there. And I would say like, that's what I'd really love to see all of us sort of like committing to do in our work. So your, your NIPSIA students, your professors, like you're in different spaces, like start thinking about how you can do that. It's not just about, you know, like Professor Harrod at the front of the room and, and, and lecturing to you, like, you know, talk, like create the dialogue in that space. Like that's really like my mantra every single day. Well, that was something. Thank you so much. I think we've reached the end of, of our panel. I'd like to thank all of you for your many contributions over the last 90 odd minutes. Uh, thank you for the incisive comments you made. Thank you for the provocative questions. Uh, and thank you for demonstrating to us various ways of being in the spaces that we, we occupy. Thank you so much. Remarkable panel, thank you. Um, thank you, there's gonna be a big, there's gonna be a lot of thank yous uh, right now. Um, personally, I don't wanna talk too much because I'll get emotional. So thank you all for being here, my family, truly. Uh, this means a lot. Um, this is a really important event and I, I can't thank you enough. I'm not gonna say more because I don't wanna cry up here. Um, so thank you all for this amazing discussion. I, I know that we all learned a lot. And thank you for all sharing your experiences. I'm going to pass the mic over to Dr. Wu. Um, he's the Associate Dean of Equity and Inclusion of the Faculty of Public Affairs at Carleton University to give our closing remarks. But for me personally, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, as was just mentioned, uh, my name is Benjamin Wu. I'm an associate professor of communication and media studies and the associate dean equity and inclusion here in the Faculty of Public Affairs. FPA is a collection of a dozen academic departments, including our hosts, the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs, that are each in their own way dedicated to the project of improving democracy, public policy, and civic engagement in Canada and abroad. So among other things, Black History Month is an occasion for our academic community to remind ourselves that democracy doesn't work if it doesn't meaningfully include Black Canadians and people of African descent. That public policy doesn't work if it doesn't account for the needs of Black communities. And civil society doesn't work if we aren't creating space for and listening to Black leaders. So on behalf of the, uh, the Faculty of Public Affairs, let me express my profound gratitude to our speakers. To Richard Sharp, to Diana Kinema, to Faduno Ali, to Samantha Munsami, to Olivier Jarda, and of course to Ariel Kayabaga, MP. We've all learned so much from your wisdom and your witness today. Thank you for sharing your experiences with us. I'd also like to acknowledge our moderator, my colleague, the uh, indefatigable Adrian Harewood and the NIPSIA Students Association for bringing us together today. Let us keep justice burning in our bellies, let us act strategically, and let us hold open doors all year long for our black classmates, colleagues, and neighbors. Thank you very much.